They also said, serve him through his Torah, serve him in his temple. This statement, serve him in his temple, means that one's goal should be to pray in the temple or in the direction of the temple, as King Solomon explained. Excellent. All right. And as we learn more of the words of Hazal, we also learn that this same concept is extended to the Beit Knesset, to the synagogue. So ideally, the ideal of ideals is to worship Hashem in the temple in Jerusalem. But obviously that's not feasible. So the next best thing we do is to serve him in, you know, a, a local a local location of, of community prayer. Um, and then there's like another step below that, which is if you cannot pray in a synagogue for whatever reason, then that you have an established place of prayer that you regularly pray. There are different concepts. Of course, we can pray in any location. But the idea is that uh, one's location does have impact on the quality of their prayer. So it's not that God changes. It's not that God hears us better in one place as opposed to another, but rather depending on the environment that we're in, our own inner sense of humility and awe of God and ability to focus can change. So having a special place appointed for that purpose that's conducive to that purpose is, is important. Does anybody have any question about what we read so far? Any questions? Oh, I have something in the chat box. I don't have, okay. I see the first thing. I don't have a mic. All right. Seth, uh, you, you had a short paragraph. So if you don't mind, you can read the first paragraph of the next mitzvah. Okay. The sixth mitzvah is that we are commanded to be close to the wise and to associate with them. We should constantly be close to them and to be with them in all possible ways of friendship, such as eating, drinking, and doing business in order to thereby succeed in emulating their actions and knowing from their words the true way of looking at things. Excellent. All right, Bon Amshich. We are going to go to Parashat Hashavua. Parashat Lech Lecha. This is one of the most famous. One of the most famous verses in, in the whole Bible among the Jewish people. All right, let's let's read it together. So everybody repeat after me. Wa yomer, wa yomer, wa yomer, adonoi, adonoi, adonoi. Okay, and let's all say it together. If if, but if you are too shy to say it out loud or can't for whatever reason then feel free to say it under your breath but the louder you say it and please don't scream but but the louder we say it uh the more it will help us remember how to pronounce it. remember that the hebrew word for reading is the same as the hebrew word to call out so reading in in a hebraic context has to do with also hearing what you're reading why yomer adonoi? All right, let's all say it together. El, 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 Avram, 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 lech, lecha, lech, lecha, lech, lecha, me ar. Secha, me ar secha, me ar secha, me ar secha, me ar secha. Beautiful. Umi me lav techa. Let's break this one up into two parts. Umi me umi me. 
All right, let's all say umimo lav techa. Lav techa. Lav techa. Okay. And I want everybody to do this when you're reading Hebrew or Aramaic or really any any word that you're reading in a different language or a language you're learning. If it's a long word, it always helps to break it up. And then after you got accustomed to reading it broken into parts, then try reading it a few times all together. So now let's do it all together slowly. Umimolav techa. Umimolav techa. All right, now we're going to make it a little bit more tricky. Does everybody see the line under this min? It's called yes. a metek. Okay, so that is telling us that the syllable of this min is the accented syllable of the word. That means this syllable, this part of the word, should stand out more than the others. So we're not just going to say, we're going to say, and I am a little bit overemphasizing it just to get the point across. So it's standing out, and we know to do that because of this little line underneath it. One other thing, and you guys don't all have to do this. I'm just trying to give a little bit of something for everybody for their level. Does anyone know what the dot inside of this mem is called? I know you do. It's a horrible question. <laughs> but speak up. Go ahead. Dagesh. Dagesh. What does Dagesh mean? What does that word Dagesh mean? It's X. It's um, a stronger um, uh, uh, pronunciation. Good. Okay. And hopefully you guys all have a pen and paper. If not, uh, I recommend getting one. So we can learn a new word. A new word now. Uh, if I can find the annotation. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to give you a new infinitive to emphasize. Okay. So in Hebrew, this is le had ish. Le had ish. Le had ish. You guys see that? Yes. All right. So you can write this down if you'd like a new word in Hebrew. Lehadish. So that's what the word dagesh means. I.e. All right. Lehad Gish to emphasize. All right. Bo Namshik. Let's continue. Everybody say Bo. 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 Namshik. 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 All right. Bo Namshik. Let's continue. Okay, so the dagesh, this is a dagesh, the dot in the mem. In classical Hebrew, as opposed to normative, modern spoken Hebrew, in classical Hebrew, if you see a consonant with this dagesh, with the dot inside of it, typically that's going to double the sound of that consonant. And it's going to double it without a vowel between the doubling. So if we could imagine this word, all right, so this is closer to like normal modern Hebrew pronunciation or standard pronunciation, and then if we were going to do the dagesh, as we should in proper Hebrew pronunciation, we would not just say umi mo, umi mo We would say umi, and then when we get to this mem, we double it. Umi mo 
umimo. So you hold it a little longer. Imagine it like this. Umimo la decha. Miss Amanda, uh, Ahava, Mashlomech. How are you doing? Good morning, Bokertov. Bokertov. Would you like to read these two transliterations and see if we can notice the difference between the two? So first you're going to read it as if we're ignoring the Dagesh. That's this one. And mm -hmm. then you're going to read it as if we're pronouncing the Dagesh. Okay. Umi moladecha. Excellent. Okay. Now this one you're going to you're going to act like it tastes. Mm -mm. <laughs> Go ahead. Umi moladecha. Umi moladecha. Excellent. That's it. You got the idea. Okay. All right, Mr. Andres, I think you get it too, but it's your turn. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, I think you got it. And Mr. Seth, you want to give it a give it a shot? Yes. <clears throat> excellent, excellent. All right. So let's continue. Get rid of this sucker. Yo, right. Seth. Yes, Yo, Seth. Yes, William, William is here with me, by the way. So you can call on him too. Oh, excellent. Bokatova here, Yapa. Bokatov. All right. It's awesome. All right. Umi Beth. Umi Beth. Everybody say Umi Beth. Umi Beth. Umi Beth. Avicha. 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 Excellent. If you guys have any question about anything you see here, please please speak up. Um, I, I do want to try to stay focused on pronunciation and uh, straightforward in, in translating of the words. But can it, um can you 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 pronounced um the word before it a little differently than I thought it would be pronounced maybe it's because of the um can you pronounce it in the Ashkenazi way for me sure sure in Ashkenazi this would be me base umi base okay, okay thank you thank so you. the only difference the only real difference in the way that I pronounce this word as opposed to the standard modern Hebrew pronunciation is I pronounce the Tav as a Th instead of a regular T. Gotcha. But as far as the vowels, I did it the same as what right, would right. normally be done. In, all right. Being sounded different. Okay, got it. Thank you. You bet. And be careful with Ashkenazi pronunciation in that a lot of people who are intending to use Ashkenazi pronunciation, they will they will pronounce the sere, which are the two dots, they'll pronounce it as a, which is pretty standard for Ashkenazi pronunciation. But then they will do the same thing for sego. So be careful that if you're using Ashkenazi pronunciation, that you're not pronouncing sego as an a as well. Ashkenazi traditionally only do the sere, the two dots as a, but the sego they do as e, e, as opposed to a. All right, and there are a few other little things that you often hear. Basically, just because we hear someone who's Ashkenazi pronounce something a certain way doesn't mean that's the way it's supposed to be done, even in Ashkenazi tradition. And that goes, Yo, yes, ma'am. Can you, can you pronounce the like the correct way in your uh, thoughts? Class, classical Hebrew? Sure. This one? Yes. Umi beth, umi beth, umi beth. So the A is there. This is A. A. Instead of A, it's A. A. Umi okay. It gets a little bit of an, an, an A sound. Oh, right. of, Good. Okay. But it, it. it shouldn't be A. It's not Umi Beth. Or um... <laughs> okay. Avicha. Uh, Avicha. Uh, Everybody say. Avicha. Uh, Avicha. Uh, okay. And... Do you see the little wishbone looking thing here? The upside down Y? Yes. All right. So that is what's called a ta'am. A ta'am. That's a cantillation mark. And when you see a cantillation mark, 
more times than not, it's going to be telling you which syllable should be accented. So all the cantillation marks can act more or less the same as a metig, which is this little sucker, the line that's going up and down. That's an accent mark. So also ta'amim in general, cantillation marks in general, can serve as accent marks. And they do not change the pronunciation of the consonant. They only tell you to elongate the vowel sound a little bit. So cantillation marks are similar but different from dagesh. Dagesh, the dot, does not tell you to elongate vowel. Dagesh only tells you to elongate the consonant. Whereas the cantillation mark or the line under here, that tells you to elongate the vowel. Right, so they're two sides, but more or less of the same coin, but two two different sides. All right, Bo and Namshik. Yes, sir. So, would the vet be, and um, would the v be elongated or the e? Okay, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you for speaking up. So, the only the only indicator that you should elongate the consonant sound. The vet would be a consonant. Vowel is a sound produced with no contact in your mouth or or constriction of muscles, right? A vowel is like a, e, o, u. So the only uh, symbol that indicates elongating, doubling consonants, such as the vet, is a dagesh. Okay, so that's what dagesh does, the dot. But the little line under here, which is called metheg, or the athnaha, or any kind of tam, any kind of cantillation mark, what they do is they tell you to elongate the vowel. The vowel, not the consonant. Okay, so Got it. both dagesh and the accent marks tell you to elongate something. But they tell you to elongate different things. Dagesh, elongate the consonant. Accent marks, elongate the vowel. And when we say to accent a syllable, all that means is that we're slightly elongating that vowel more than other vowels in the word. That's all that it is. That's what it means to accent. You're just elongating it a little longer so it stands out in, to your hearing. Okay. El, everybody say El. El. All right. Ha, a, res. Ha, a, res. Ha, a, res. Excellent. Sahaba Atitano, you with us? Atitano. All right. A uh, share. A uh, share. A uh, share. Ar eka. Ar eka. Ar eka. Excellent, excellent. Mr. Mr. William. Are you maybe you guys have your mic uh turned off? Yeah, here we are. Oh, uh, okay. Mr. William Mashlum Khan. Yes. <laughs> All right, I want to hear you, sir. Ar eka. Ar eka. Ar eka. All right, and this this cough is going to just be a regular K as in Kit Kat bar. And how do we know this is a K as in Kit Kat bar as opposed to a cough sound? Is it the dagesh in the middle? Nachon. That's it. That's right. Nachon. All right. Mr. William, are you ready to read a phrase? I'm giving you a big chunk. There you are. Take your time. Biomer. Uh, all right. Now, I want you guys, all of you guys, to either read when you're reading, like if I call on you specifically, to either read using classical Hebrew or using standard Hebrew pronunciation of, of modern Hebrew. Um, I, I, I don't want to make anyone feel bad for using Ashkenazi Hebrew, but the fact of the matter is Ashkenazi Hebrew is so pervasive in the Torah observant world and outside of Israel that 
you know, there are already plenty of places where they can use that and where people even feel pressure to use it. So here I'm going to put pressure in a different direction. <laughs> I, I highly encourage everybody to either try to use proper classical Hebrew, which is authentic Hebrew of the Jewish people, historical Hebrew of the Jewish people, or to use the standard modern Hebrew. Um, that way you're using something that's a little more practical that you're not going to get everywhere else, right? Um, okay, so if you want to pronounce Vav, um, the letter wall as a V, perfectly fine. But I do want you guys to pay attention to the accent marks, whether you're using classical or modern Hebrew pronunciation. Take note of the accent marks because the, they don't always follow uh, standard accents. So where there's a ta'am, where there's a cantillation mark, that syllable should have an accent. All right, Mr. William, od ta'am. So is it Wyomer? It is Wyo it's Wyomer. That's right, Wyomer. And okay. when you guys are doing it, uh, I do recommend to even overemphasize it. Over time, you're not going to overemphasize it. But when we're first doing it, I want you to overemphasize the accenting so you really hear clearly in your head which part of the word is being accented. So, for example, we're not going to just say Wyomer. We're going to say Wyomer, Wyomer. You got it. You got it. Now, what does this dot do in the yud? What does that do? Uh, I don't know. Does it elongate the word, the sound? I don't know. Correct. And is it going to elongate the y sound, or is it going to elongate the vowel? The vowel. All right. So dagesh always refers to elongating the consonant sound, the letter. All right. Okay. The dagesh never tells us to elongate the vowel. This vowel, we did elongate this vowel, and this vowel should be elongated. But this vowel, we know to elongate it not because of the dot in the yud, not because of the dagesh. We know to elongate the vowel because of the ta'am that's underneath it. I see. Okay. You got it? You got it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Go ahead. Bachavod. Vayomer. Vayomer. All right. Tamshikh, continue. Adonai, Adonai el Avraham. No, Avram. Avram, Avram. All right. Tadaraba. Miss Heather, Tur Shalach. Your turn. Tur Shalach. Lech, Lecha. Lech lecha, excellent. Okay, that was too easy. You gotta keep going. <laughs> Milaha ba'a. Next word. Milaha ba'a. Milaha ba. Milaha ba'a. That means next word. Mila is a word, and ha ba'a means the next in the feminine form. Milaha ba'a. Like, uh, who knows? Who knows this? Lashana haba'a birushalayim. Lashana haba'a birushalayim. Does that sound familiar? Next year in Jerusalem. Nachon. That's right. So it's the same word. Lashana haba'a. We say that when? When do we say Lashana haba'a birushalayim? When do we say Lashana haba'a birushalayim? Next year in Jerusalem. At the end of the Seder? Yeah, fair. Quite a couple. Excellent. Also, Deborah mentioned in Passover. That's right. Okay, so when I say Mila Haba'a, Haba'a means the same thing here as what we say on Passover. It means next. It's just the feminine form of like Baruch Haba. That's masculine. Okay, Bo Namshikh. Heather, Tamshikhi, Bevakasha. Continue, please. Me. Okay, good, good. We're going to break this word down a little more, all right? First thing, okay. though, that I want us to look at is these two shavas, right? Shava is the name of the two little dots. Should actually be shawa, but everybody calls it shava. We have two. 
can anyone tell us what to do when we have two? There's a principle, a general rule, and please write it down if you do not already know the rule. There are two. There are two consonants with separation, so it's like syllables, like separating syllables. They are two separate syllables. That's right. So how do we pronounce it? How many types of shava are there? Even if they look the same, how many types of shava are there? Two. Nachon, that's right. The two types of shavah. What are the two types of shavah? Sounded and unsounded. Excellent. Excellent. Shwa na and shwa nah. The moving shava and the resting shava. That's how you say the sounded and silent. So you can write that down also. So the two types of shava are shwa. Na and Shawa Na. The seven symbolizes a het, and the three symbolizes an ayin. So Shawa Na is sounded Shawa. Moving. And then the shavana is resting. It's silent. All right? Now, when you have two shavas in a row, are you going to pronounce both shavas the same way or differently? I don't know. Anybody want to give it a gander? I don't know. I know that's the wrong word. <laughs> give it a guess. <laughs> Differently. Differently. Okay. Now, which one should be pronounced what? The resh should be resting. How do you know that? And when we, again, when we say resting, shavana. That means silent. So you're saying that the the, the shawa, the two dots under the resh, indicate no pronunciation of a vowel. It's just the end of the syllable, of the current syllable, right? Right. So the resh should be silent. It should be a silent shawa. The sound of the letter resh should not be silent. But the sound of the shava is silent, meaning it does not make a sound. It's just symbolizing end of syllable. That's what the silent shava does. Anytime you have a silent shava, all that means is that the silent shava is indicating end of the current syllable. So this shava under the resh means it's the end of the syllable that started with aleph. Ar, ar, that's one syllable. So not are, but ar. And then the second one will be sounded. That's the shava na, the moving shava, the sounded shava. So our principle is when you have two shavas in a row, when you have two shavas in a row, please write this down if you don't already know it. When you have two shavas in a row, the first shava will be silent, and the second shava will be sounded. All right, Heather, you ready to continue? Yes. Okay, can you please summarize for us again this principle we just learned? So when you have two shava together, the first is resting and the second is moving. Excellent. You're familiar. Okay, now let's say this again. Go ahead. Take do it syllable by syllable. Me ar zecha. All right. So in proper classical Hebrew, the Saudi is a type of S sound. So okay. you can pronounce it if you if you prefer. 
just as a S and you can work on how to pronounce that S properly uh, by yourself or we can practice it one on one. Um, but it's an S, but not the same kind of an S as the letter seen or summit. So this kind of S is what's called a, a uh, emphatic or plosive S. And it's also called pharyngealized. But that's see, that's why I don't want to get into it right now. It's just confusing. <laughs> but for simplicity's sake, it's just pronounced as an S as opposed to a TS. Right? The standard modern Hebrew pronunciation is like a TS, like S. And even though people call modern Hebrew Sephardic, that is not the that's not the traditional Sephardic pronunciation of Saudi. That was adopted from the Ashkenazi pronunciation. So the TS pronunciation is Ashkenazi. T-S. T-S Saudi is Ashkenazi. And in S is mainstream Middle Eastern beauty. Pharyngeal. I don't even know how to spell this word. <laughs> All right. So, with, go ahead. My tongue would be on the roof of my mouth and kind of cupped. Is that right? Can you? I, I missed what you said. Could you say it again, please? It, so you cut out. You when cut you're out. saying that, okay, um, you put your tongue on the ridge of the roof of your mouth and have a little cupped. Is that right? Very good. That's right. It's actually what what the tet with the letter tet is to tav, ta is to ta. That's what saudi is to seen. Literally, you're doing the same thing. It's just instead of tet, you're doing a s, uh, a saudi. But you're putting your tongue in the same place as you would for a tet. All right. But again, okay. Let's not get too much into that right now. Even though I can't help myself. <laughs> okay. So let's read it one more time. Just remember, Saudi, if you're doing classical Hebrew, is not going to be a TS. But in this class, Saudi should always be either a S sound or a TS sound. The TS will be the modern Hebrew sound. But we're not going to pronounce it as like a Z. They transliterate it as a Z very mm -hmm. often in transliterations. But mm -hmm. nobody really pronounces that as a Z. All right, me arab sakha, me arab sakha. And Heather, can you tell me why I'm saying me arab sakha instead of me arab sakha? Because of the accent under the mem. Here, under the mem, that's right. Okay, your turn. Tur shalach, your turn. Me arab sakha. Me arab sakha. Me arsaha. Odpam again. Me arsaha. That's it. That's it. All right. Let's get uh, someone else. Do the next few words. Do we have anyone new in here? All right, Mr. Andres, Tur Shalcha. Your turn. Ya Achi, when next? Efata. All right, I guess he's busy. Um, Amanda, would you like to read the next few words? Yes, let me move out of the noise. Hold on. Okay. Okay, umimo led tacha. All right, let's look at this syllable. Can you say that syllable one more time? Lad, lad tacha. Okay, you got Sorry. it. Okay, go ahead. Od palm again. Od palm. Umimo lad tacha. Excellent. Okay, now let's read it one more time and notice where the accent syllable should be. Umimo lad tacha. 
Good, umimolatecha, umimolatecha. Excellent. Okay, go ahead and read the next next two words. Okay. Umibet avicha. Excellent. Umibet avicha. All right, Mr. Seth. Ataitano? You with us? Ataitano? Yes. Go. Tur shalcha. Everybody say tur. 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 All right. Tur means turn. Tur shalcha. Your turn. Tur shalcha. Bachavo. Go right ahead. Take your time reading. El haaresh. No. Haaresh. Excellent. Haaresh. Haaresh. Asher. All right. Would the accent below elongate the vowel or the consonant? So the... the only the only symbol that will tell you to elongate the consonant will be a dagesh. So if it's not a dagesh inside the letter, then it's it's not going to tell you to elongate the consonant. But there is an there is a time here, so you're going to accent that syllable. But the accent's going to be in the vowel, right? Okay. Only the dagesh tells you to accent consonant. So what is the... Go ahead. Asher. Exactly. Asher. 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 And you would know this, honestly, you would know this in this case, even if there was no uh, cancellation mark here, because... There's only two syllables in this word, and the other syllable is a shortened pata. When you have a vowel in Hebrew together with a shava, that means you're under accenting it. So we would know that this should be the accented syllable, even if there were no tam, even if there was no cantillation mark here. We would know it'd be the accented syllable because the only other syllable is explicitly unaccented. Right. Okay. When you have a shava, that's an un. If you have a sounded shava, that's an always an unaccented syllable. Shava na. The sounded shava is always the unaccented syllable. You guys can write that down if you'd like. The so the sounded shava. In the case that the shava is sounded, it's never going to be the accented syllable. And of course, I'm going to contradict myself. I have noticed when reading the, the parasha over the years that there are some places where the unaccent the unaccented syllable will have a ta'am there. And it's a contradiction in terms. Like I've seen places where it will have a metic. It's a contradiction. Either it's maybe a typo in the text or in the manuscripts, or it's just an anomaly and you really cannot it's, it's, it's an overt contradiction. There's no way around it. So, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that to let you know that you might see it, but the standard rule, the basic basics of Hebrew is that patah or any vowel with a shava is going to be unaccented. All right, asher. Okay. Asher. Ar echo. No, ar echo. Excellent. Our echo. Beautiful. All right, Mr. William Taitano, are you with us? Taitano? I can't hear you. Maybe you're on mute. Amanda, would you like to help us with translating? I'm sorry, Ahava. I keep saying Amanda because that's what's on your. Okay. Yes. Let me let me hold out. Hold on. Yeah, one second. One second. Yeah, one of you. Whatever you want, one. I'll give a chocolate. <laughs> we are in, we are St. Thomas. So. Oh wow! That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, all right. Translate this first word. Translate. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by Yome, um, and he said, I don't Excellent. remember. That's right, and he said. Okay, great. Right. How do you know that? Now you got to prove yourself. Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's just like coming out of my memory. <laughs> All right. So generally, third person masculine past tense. That's like oh. saying he said, right? He is third person. It's masculine. And it's past tense. He said generally, well, technically speaking, that kind of verb in Hebrew is always going to be the most simple form of a verb. It's generally just three letters. Okay, so technically speaking, he said in Hebrew is Amar, Amar. Okay. All right. This that I have highlighted here does mean he said. But my question is, why is it not Amar? Why is it Wayyeme? Because the Vav uh, means and, and he said. So the Vav does mean and, but still the, you... oh. go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay, Omer means said, so the, the Yud must be implicated here and, and to the reason why. All right, so the form of third person masculine singular, like he said in Hebrew, that is going to be without a Yud. That's just going to be Amar, Amar, no Yud. So how do we... Yomar does not mean he said. So how does this mean he said? And it does. I'm not saying you're wrong. You're actually right. But how? <laughs> I just, I don't, I honestly don't know. This, the Holy Spirit told you, right? <laughs> just, just, just when you, <laughs> when in doubt, the Holy Spirit told me, right? <laughs> why, but why is it past tense? That's your question? Yes. Okay. Because past tense, everybody should know this. Okay. Past tense, masculine, third person, that's like he. That is always the most simple form of a verb, an action word in Hebrew. Like amar, he said, halach, he went, achal, he ate. It's always the most simple form. And you should know that because that's the form of a verb you want to use when you're looking up a word in Hebrew in a dictionary. The, the dictionary is not going to give you every form of a verb, right? You're not going to look up Wayomer in a dictionary. It's not there. You're going to have to look up Amar. And you just need to know that it's the basic three-letter root. That is the third person, masculine, uh, singular. All right? So Wayomer is not that. Wayomer does not mean, literally, it does not mean he said. So why are we saying that it means he said? Anybody have any suggestion? Ask uh, William if he has any idea. Okay, hold on one second. Does anybody, anyone else have any suggestion? <laughs> Mr. Seth, any suggestion? If I heard correctly, you said it was past tense or you said Ahmad is past tense? So this is past tense, but but as far as conjugation is going, as far as conjugation goes, it technically is not the past tense form of the verb, but it is past tense. It's a it's a paradox, and there is an explanation for it. So I'm looking for someone to give an explanation. Amar is the past tense masculine singular. So he said. Technically, it should be Amar. So why are we saying Wayomer means he said? Wayomer looks like he shall say. Right? If you put a Yud at the beginning of a verb, the Yud makes it he will, he shall. So why are we saying it means he said? Andres, Efoato. Do you have any thoughts on on this 
conundrum this question uh yes i think i think okay uh, how do we know that it's he said instead of he will say because it looks like he okay. will say he will say yes because of the eight and letter you uh, that of, will be future like you say right correct if you but have the yud, it makes it the, he will go ahead he will so why so when, when you put the vav good the vav is the conversive vav i think they call it or the vav correct vav. you can call it a few a few different things you can call it conversive or reversive so in biblical hebrew that's exactly right so in biblical hebrew uh very often when you have a future tense form of a verb such as this the yud makes it future tense third person he so he will very often in biblical hebrew when you have a he will type verb at the beginning of a phrase if it's preceded by a vav that vav doesn't merely mean and that vav is actually reversing the tense it's just a weird thing in biblical hebrew and it's one of the main differences between biblical hebrew and modern hebrew okay so also in biblical hebrew this is not generally he said this would it would generally be he will say but because it's at the beginning of a phrase and it's preceded by a vav so we know that it's more likely intended to be he said in the past tense it reversed it this vav flipped the tense so that's the answer so darabaya afi Mr. Andres, would you like to translate the the next phrase? Okay, okay. Adonai el Abraham. Uh, so Adonai unto Abraham. Good. So let's translate this whole thing right here. And Adonai said to Abraham, okay. Lech Lecha. Okay. And uh, Lech Lecha is kind of weird to translate because Lech is the command form, right? To Good. Lech to is go. the command form for what? To go. Nachon. That's right. And then Lecha is like for yourself, right? Exactly, for you or for yourself. That's right. All right. Tamshikh. Me arsecha. Me arsecha. And then, uh, so we see there uh, me, which means from. Excellent. And then I see the word added. And cha at the end is the suffix, pronominal suffix, you, from your land. Good. So me is from, the cha is your, and the aras is land. So from your land. All right, let's 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 get Heather to translate one. Well, this is a hard one. Um, Heather, would you like to give it a shot? Um, I'm not sure how much else I can do. <laughs> this one's a mouthful. So this one, I'll just, just, I'll just save some time. Um, just focus on prefixes and suffixes. Just identify for us what is the prefix here and what is the suffix here. Uh, the wall and the prof. The wall and the what? So and. The cough. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So the wall is an and, the cough is a suffix. What does the cough mean? Uh, your. Excellent. So cough always at the end of a word means you or your. Ninety-nine percent of the time. Okay. And any other prefixes or suffixes? Is the first mem 
also a prefix? Correct. The first mem. So what does this me mean? Me. Um. Right, everybody write this down. Me. So if we have an E sound at the end of a noun, at the end of a noun, it would be mine. It would make something possessive. We have an E sound. But here, me at the beginning, it means... Mr. Seth, you want to give it a shot? From? Nachon. So me as a prefix. I want everybody to write this down if, if you did not already know it. Me as a prefix. Me equals from or than. Also be of. So it can be any of these three. Mr. William. He's here. Okay. Mr. William, what does a mem prefix mean? From. All right. What else can it mean? I don't know. All right. Van. T-H-A-N. So it, it, it more often than not will mean from, but it can also mean van in the sense of comparing one thing as being greater or lesser than something else. Okay. All right. You guys write that down if you have a pen and paper. All right, Mr. Mr. Chris, would you like to read the next two words? Okay. Umi Umi Beth Avicha. All right, let's look at this. You got it. How did you know? How did you know to correct that? Uh, because the 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 yud elongates the the sound. I don't know. Well, you mean the upside down wishbone thingy? Oh, yeah. yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, the cancellation mark. All right. Yeah. All right. Tatargen bevakasha. Tatargen. Translate tatargen. Me. And, uh, and from the house and the house. Wifey, just know that we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm translating too. We hear you. No cheating. <laughs> She's like, right. tell, Woman him, tell him it means and. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to go with what she said and the house. Play safe, huh? Um, and and from the house? Yes, and from the house. Uh, uh, I don't know that one. Look for suffixes or prefixes. Suffixes. Suffix is something added at the end of a word. Prefix is added at the beginning. Yeah. Hebrews, all about suffixes and prefixes. Well, the 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 um the prefix here is is the aleph. So aleph can be a prefix. Aleph can be a prefix, but. But but more often than not, it's far more common that a chaf at the end of a word is a suffix. That's far more common than that the aleph at the beginning of a word would be a prefix. Aleph at the beginning of a word can be a prefix, but it's not always. Chaf so, at the 
end of a word is like 99.999% for sure a prefix. There's just a handful of words that end with a chaf that's not a prefix. So the the, the chaf is a, is a suffix, right, in this word? Correct, correct. And I meant to say suffix, correct. And so the prefix is uh, the, the vet? So there is no prefix here. <laughs> no prefix. No, there's no prefix. Okay. Yeah. And... I mean, yeah. it's already a short word. So if chaf is the suffix, more likely than not, there are no prefixes here. I see. Okay. Okay. So what are we left with? Huh? From? Chaf. Ah. Yeah, chaf. What does av mean? Av? Yes, sir. I don't know. Does it have something to do with like the morning or like time? No. Did you say morning? Yeah. Uh, Ave no. Avel would be a mourner. If you put an L at the end, it means like someone who's mourning. But okay. Av means father. Oh, oh yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Avicha? The question is, what is the Chafi as a suffix? I don't know. Chaf? Oh, definitely. You guys need to write this down. Everybody needs to write this down if, if, if you don't already know. That's good. Deborah says, father of. So, avicha. Well, the avi part means father of. And then the cha. Everybody should write this down. Cha is a suffix. Ah, suffix equals you or your always that's always what it means you or your okay so you need to know from context whether it means you or your if the word is a noun it will be your if the word is a verb then the chaf is a direct object pronoun attached to the end which would be you so it's your your Correct. father exactly yeah oh. and definitely write this down because it's like the most common suffix it's everywhere i mean just look in this just look in this verse by itself yeah right it's, it's everywhere you have to learn that like number one put it on your fridge it's like Number one priority. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Does, uh, does the last word there with the ka uh, pronunciation mean the same thing? Your a uh, your yes. or you? Yes, okay. it does. In modern Hebrew, would not do this, and it's just a um, what do you call it? An idiosyncrasy syncrasy of the uh, of Hebrew pronunciation. It means exactly the same thing. Perhaps okay. in ancient Hebrew, it had some kind of uh, extra meaning. I mean, it would have meant you or your always, but it may have had a grammatical function. I'm not sure because other Semitic languages have what are called. Oh, my gosh. I always forget this word. Who can tell me what it means when you add things to the end of words that it that will indicate what part of. That will indicate what kind of word it is whether it's a direct object or passive i always forget that term anyway who would like to read the next few words almost finished we're about to start mission at torah i would like to all right go right ahead sir Wait, I heard someone else. I think I heard someone else say that they want to. Amanda, okay. do, you, do you want? It's okay. I went. It's okay. I just didn't hear anybody going, so I said, "Okay." Aww. Okay. <laughs> L is to or towards. Excellent. How do you know that it's not God? Because of the of the vowel, it's a segol and not a serre. Excellent. So everybody mark that down if you did not know. If it's God or power, it will be two dots under the Aleph. El, El. 
And if it's two or toward, it's going to be three dots. L. L. All right. Tamshikh, Bavakasha. Continue. Tamshikh. He is the prefix, and it means the. Nachon, that's right. Aris means land. All right, so, so el, el Haaris. Towards the land. Great, call it out. Asher that ar echo. That I do not know what that means. All right, but I'm Identif guessing it means I give you. Okay, so first isolate the suffix or prefix. The suffix in ar echo is the kaf. All right, and what would that mean? Your. Good. You. Correct. So you or your, depending on whether it's a noun or a verb. Now, we know that asher means that. So if we translate what comes before, it can help us figure out what whether this is more likely a verb or a noun. So, lech uh, lecha, go out for yourself. Mi bet avicha. From the house of Yichai, of your father, El Haaretz, toward the land, Asher, which, for the land which, or to the land that, and then something you or your. So, more likely than not, this is a verb. So, we would translate it as you, that something you. So, let's see. Aleph, is, it can be a prefix. If Aleph's a prefix, what would it mean? I do not know. All right, let's all write this down. Aleph, when it's a prefix, it means I will. I will. I will, whatever the verb is. Okay, Aleph is a prefix. When Aleph's attached to a verb, it means I will. I shall. Go for yourself. From the house of your father. Toward the land. Toward the land which I will blank you. Give you. That, that makes sense. Makes sense. But let's look at these two letters. Maybe it sounds like a word that you already know. Let's just read the highlighted letters. Can you read that for me, Ahava? Just the highlighted letters. Re. Come again. Re. But how many syllables are here? Oh, re. -e. You got it. Re -e. What does that sound like? This is one of the most common words in the Bible. Re. -e. Re -e. Can anyone tell me what e or ra means? What is ra? -a? I don't know why I keep thinking like the word. I'm not sure if I'm like evil. I'm not. I feel like it's oh, not. Well, right. that, that would make sense. That would make sense because okay, yeah, ra -a. Ra, -a, ra a means evil if you have an i in there, and this is just one of the many reasons. Why we should always in our head, at least in our head, but preferably also when we say it, distinguish between Aleph and Ayin. Mm -hmm. It helps a lot in learning Hebrew if you can internalize the difference between Aleph and Ayin. Ra a with an Ayin is evil, female form. It's an evil woman. <laughs> but Ra a with an Aleph is not evil. Got it. Right? Ra a evil. Ra a has to do with sight. Ah. That you that you see. So what does the Aleph prefix mean? What did you say it meant? I lost it. Oh, um, you didn't write it down, did you? Uh -huh. No, I don't have a pen. I don't have a pen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will. Oh, you got it. Good. I will see you. Okay, mm -hmm. now think think what, what would make more sense here. To the land that I will. What's a similar word to see? It may not sound exactly the same, but similar. Sh 
show, the land that I will show you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so showing and seeing in Hebrew, they're the same root word. Okay. Right. And in any language, even if they sound differently, they're similar concepts to show and to see. To show is to cause something to be seen. All right. So I recommend writing that down. Ah, it's a very common verb. Who knows the term lehit raot? Lehit raot. See you later. Oh, yeah. Do you have the ra in there? The rash alef. Ra'ah. Lehit raot. All right, Mr. Seth. Ataitanu? Yes. All hmm. right. How about you you translate this first part, this first phrase? And he said, and said, and said the eternal one towards to Avram. Excellent. Andres, Ataitanu? Yes, here. Would you do us the honor of reading the highlighted portion? Yes. And he Lech, said, Lech, and, Lech. and the Lord said to Abraham, go ahead. And the Lord said to Abraham, Lech, Lech Lecha, Me'ar Zecha, Umimol Adetecha. Right, it's a Targem, translate. It's a Targem. Go for yourself, go if you will, from your land and from the place of your birthing, right? Excellent, that's birth right, place. that's right. All right, Mr. William, Tur Shalcha, your turn. Okay, what do you want me to read? The highlighted portion, The sir. highlighted part, okay. So, first in Hebrew, then translate. Ume be avicha. Okay. Uh, from my father's house. Old palm, do it again. Okay. Uh, Ume be avicha. Okay. Ume be, what does that mean? Uh, uh, from my father, right? Where's the my father? Where's that? At? Or from from your father's. I'm sorry. From your father's. Okay. So translate it again. What does it mean? From your father's house. All right. You got it. All right. Miss Heather, would you like to translate the next? Toward the land. Excellent. Call a couple. And I'm trying to make sure I'm not skipping anyone. And Amanda, how about you translate the last part? Um, I share that ar, ar, areja. Areja. Ar, do you see the ar, accent syllable? I mean, the accent symbol under the aleph? Ar, areja. Areja. Sure. Areja. What does that mean? Your. Good. Well, it's you or your. It depends on whether okay. it's a verb or a noun. Okay, so maybe. Uh, we have the Aleph. Aleph here. Mm -hmm. Prefix. Will. Will? I will. Aleph is I will. Aleph for Ani. Aleph, imagine it symbolizing Ani. I will. I will show the land. That I will show you. Right. All right, you guys ready for Mishneh Torah? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Go. Oh, it's already there. All right, who can tell me where to go? This is the table of contents for the Mishneh Torah. We're going to the foundations of Torah. Yesodeh HaTorah. All right, Sin Sefer Hamada. 
the book of knowledge. Okay, it's the first sub volume. We are in the second, in the second chapter. Last week we learned about how our love of Hashem and our fear of Hashem is inherently commensurate to the degree of our knowledge and appreciation for the greatness of creation. If we're not impressed by creation, it's going to be very difficult for us to be imbued with fear of Hashem. So in the approach of the Rambam, in the approach of Maimonides to fear and love of God, he holds that this is not merely an emotional uh, rapture, like an emotional uh, ecstasy without comprehension. The Rambam holds that the fear and love of Hashem that we're commanded to have in the Torah is a fear and love of Hashem, which it's an intellectual understanding and appreciation and awe of God, which is a consequence of, of comprehension of the immensity of creation. So yeah, there is an emotional element to it, but it's not, it's not an emotional reaction, which is, irrational rather it's the opposite it's a very rational emotional reaction and 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 impetus to doing his commandments and so it's it's tied to understanding how great creation is 